I'd now like to introduce Congresswoman Norma Torres, the only member. <laughs> Congresswoman Thank you Torres so much. Thank you is so the only much. member of Congress from uh, of Guatemalan descent. Yes. Yeah. Guatemalan descent representing here as well. Chapina. <laughs> Chapina, yeah. Congresswoman Torres worked as a 911 dispatcher for the LAPD for 17 years, and it was through her efforts to address the lack of Spanish speaking dispatchers that she first became involved in politics. Much of the Congresswoman's work in the House of Representatives has been focused on job creation and economic growth, and she's a member of the powerful House Committee on Rules. Welcome, Congresswoman Torres, and Lulu, back to you. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start the same way I did before. Um, I, you know, you have a very interesting history. Can you tell us how you came to this country and why you got involved in politics? Absolutely. You know how I came to this country. I really don't um, often, you know, talk about. It. It's uh, like all immigrant story. It's a very sad story. My parents sent me here uh, to live with my father's oldest brother uh, because my mother was very ill. Um, Guatemala was in a very tough situation with civil war um, in, the, in the early 70s. Um, so they decided to uh, send me here to live with my, uh, my uncle. I grew up, I say you that I- You were five, right? I, yes. So I say that I, I, I'm Guatemalan. I was born in Escuintla, Guatemala. Um, but I'm also Mexican because my uncle's uh, wife was Mexican. So. I grew up listening to mariachis, uh, cooking Mexican <laughs> food. I don't know how to cook a single Guatemalan dish, but I know how to cook a lot of Mexican dishes. I think that could be said for many of us, actually. Um, Mexican cuisine, I just came back from Mexico and it was great. Um, uh, tell me about um, how you got into politics. What, what was the thing that called you to serve? Uh, all of us as uh, women, and especially, you know, I see a lot of young women in the audience. I think you have to prepare yourselves for that moment uh, when your call to duty is made to you. And for me, it was, uh, it was a summer night at the 911 center. I was one of two uh, 911 dispatchers that spoke Spanish in the city of Los Angeles. One of two? One of two. In Los Angeles? In the city of Los Angeles. And um, what happened was, I, I took this call. It was an open line on 911. All I could hear were screams and you know horrible screams, children um, thumping, followed by five shots. I dispatched officers. And later that night, I found out that the screams were not just screams. You know, there were words. There were words from an 11-year-old that was murdered at the hands of her uncle. And her last words were, "Uncle, please don't kill me." And um, it was. As horrible as that may sound to you, um, I think the biggest tragedy is that she waited 20 minutes for me to answer the call. Mm. And that is not um, acceptable. 911, you know, is your Because call. she was speaking Spanish. She was speaking Spanish. And you were the only one of two people who could. Right. Any other language, she would have been transferred to the language bank and somebody would have immediately helped her. But because she spoke Spanish and they were, we had in-house uh, Spanish speaker, she had to wait and wait and wait until her turn came mm -hmm. and I uh, was able to answer her call. So I began this journey um, and you know, I was just the mom next door. I was involved in my kids' um, school and uh, I didn't want to be bothered with politics. I don't like politics. I hated politics. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, comes the time that we have to do not necessarily what we like to do, but uh, it's something that I have to do to help my community, which is what I really love to do. And uh, I learned how to lobby the city council members in the city of Los Angeles. I took on my department. It's not easy to take on an LA, uh, you know, a, a police department. Um, it was a really tough time for me, but it was important to speak out for those who could not speak for themselves. This is the time during Proposition 187. So it was a very turbulent time in California, anti-Latino, uh, anti uh, being bilingual, and um, it was not an easy uh, thing to do. Um, but thank God that I was strong enough and I had people um, to help me through that process. And, you know, I have a strong husband who cares about the work that I do and supports me in everything that I do. Having good su family support is always yeah. so important. Uh, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about this moment in the Democratic Party. 
um, and specifically when we look at the Latino vote. Yeah. Um, there has been such a discussion for so long that the Latinos are finally going to, you know, the sleeping giant will awaken and, and, um, and, and that Latinos will vote. Um, we saw the California primaries um, that Latinos voted in increasing numbers, yes. but they didn't vote for Latinos. Can you talk yeah. about that? What, um, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, and it's a good question for all of us to ask our friends and neighbors and families. You know, uh, the sleeping giant, um, we're all waiting for the sleeping giant to wake up. And what's it going to take? Um, you know, President uh, Trump is in office. Uh, look what he's done, uh, not just to uh, the Latino community, but immigrants as a whole, our nation as a whole. Um, he's compromising us in every single uh, uh, position that we hold uh, globally. So what is it going to take um, is my question to every voter in my community. Um, it, it's, it's not enough to say, I'm going to be vocal and I'm going to go and march. They love marching. That doesn't count. You know, they love social media. I'm sorry, that doesn't count. You know what matters? is showing your muscle at the ballot box because Anonymous doesn't have a voting record. And elections have consequences. And right now, the consequences, uh, the price of this last election is being paid by toddlers and babies in a jail cell. Um, we just had a member of the administration here. And, um, I, um, and I, would, I would say, that one of the criticisms made of the Democratic Party is that the message can't just be anti-Trump. Mm -hmm. But that seems to be the only right. message that, that, is, um, that is being um, pushed out. I mean, uh, there's an incredible amount of economic optimism among Latinos. Right. 11 to some say 24% of Latinos voted for, uh, for President Trump in 2016. Um, and, and by and large, when you poll Latinos, while immigration is important, while they do feel um, targeted, um, they vote like a lot of other people with their pocketbooks. So what is the message that the Democratic Party has for Latinos? Uh, the message is very simple. If your pocketbook is important to you, then you're a big loser in this administration. Uh, if you think the trade war is not going to have an impact in your business, uh, it may not have an immediate impact, but there are companies right now that are laying off hundreds of people because of the problems that he is causing abroad. So wait your turn. Um, right now, again, it's uh, but it's, it's still immigrants. All about president, but it's all about the president. I mean, when you when you speak to your constituents, um, you know. How, how do you motivate Latino voters to get out and go to the ballot box? What is, in your view, as a Hispanic and, as, and, as a, and, and you represent many Latinos, what is it that motivates them? What is the message that, that really will, will get them enthused for themselves? All right. So at home, um, in my community, I represent the 35th Congressional District. Uh, we were a manufacturing district. Um, that has, you know, gone away. Um, we're now um, a major uh, logistics uh, industry. That's the number one job growth in our community. So I talk a lot about jobs, about improving the economy, about diversifying our job market, about the challenges of the working poor in my community that are working two or three jobs um, and don't have access to public, affordable, and reliable uh, public transportation. Uh, those are the things that they want to um, hear. It's not necessarily, you know, another um, um, government program. It's they want they want to be able to be that proud mom and dad, and you know, be able to provide for for their community. But see how long it took to talk about that. <laughs> the media doesn't cover that. They won't give us the time to talk about that. You can I, come on NPR. We oh, give lo loads of time. NPR is wonderful. <laughs> Just had to do a little plug there. Well, I listen to NPR every morning as we're getting dressed. <laughs> um, I love it. But I know what you mean. Yes. Um, so I do that with my voters. Look, if you, if, if San Bernardino County, which is uh, the biggest part of my district that I represent, I got the highest percentage of, um, of votes among the Democrats running in, in, in that county. And why, why was that? because I didn't take a, uh, my election for granted. I walked precincts myself. I went door to door 
I talk to my constituents because no one is that important to not go to your door and ask you for your I vote. Was, that was my next question. I was wondering about the Democratic Party writ large. Um, clearly, the GOP has its own challenges with the Latino community, but d does the Democratic Party take it for granted? I mean, Bill Nelson of Florida, um, you know, the incumbent senator, uh, has been doing no Spanish language out outreach in Florida. Um, <laughs> you know, where you have Governor yes. Rick Scott, uh, who is the former governor, um, you know, really pushing and talking to Latinos. I mean, what is your message to the to the Democratic Party in terms of ta of the Latino vote? Right, and broadly, you know, we have to go back to showing up at the polls, right? Right. Um, broadly, I think the Democratic Party has lacked um, outreach to Latinos. Um, as a Latina and as someone that campaigns every campaign season and you know really enjoys it, I know that our voters go out when we ask them to go out and we tell them why they need to go out. Um, so they need that face to face. Um, because we don't show up, you know, the party as a whole has felt well, we have to focus on those who will show up. And it's only been in areas and in districts that you know, we, we are 100, 200 votes short that we start looking for where we can pick um, a, a group of voters that we can help turn out. I think uh, President- Opportunistic. It's a, yeah, but I think President Obama in 2008 really got it right. And um, I wish we would go back and, and look at that model. Uh, I was a mayor of my home city of Pomona at the time. Uh, he reached out to me. I endorsed him very early as a super delegate. He sent me to Texas. He sent me to Florida. He sent me to the Iowa caucus um, to campaign for him. I was not campaigning in communities other than Central American communities, you know, where there are pockets of 250 to 500 um, uh, Central Americans. And I was talking directly to the people who understood my background, understood who I was, and that I can communicate with, that looked a lot like my district, you know, my home city of Pomona, you know, where I represented. And you know what? I I truly believe that he won um, Iowa the Iowa caucus Storm Lake specifically because I was campaigning there. And you know what? I wasn't ashamed to chase. A, uh, a young 18-year-old prom queen because <laughs> I knew that getting that prom queen to the caucus was getting all of the young boys that really liked her. <laughs> and all of That's the one young, way to get the vote. <laughs> and all of the young personalities that were following her um, to the polls. And you know, knowing your target, and I think President Obama in the 2008 um, election really understood that, targeted those um, small pockets of voters, and that is what we need to do today. Bold Pack gets it. Bold Pack has been out there, um, you know, talking to Latino voters, uh, educating them. You know, we've been working uh, with with other groups, and it's uh, I think it's having an impact. We only have a, a, this portion a few minutes left, so I do want to ask you about the latest news because, again, I'm a journalist. Um, we have Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez's win over uh, Joe Crawley in New York. Uh, she's 28. Uh, yes. She's a self-avowed socialist, Bernie Sanders supporter. Um, it's getting a lot of attention, obviously, because he was slated maybe to uh, yeah. take over um, for Nancy Pelosi. That obviously now isn't going to happen. What does this say to you? Um, people are reading a lot into it. I'd like to hear your thoughts. Well, I think it's an opportunity for us. I'm saddened um, that uh, Joe Crawley lost his election, but I think it's an opportunity for, uh, for our young voters, for young Latinas to see themselves um, that you can do it. You know, I hope that you know, your goal is not uh, to replace me. Your goal is to actually <laughs> enhance you know, our, 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 our party and grow. Um, our ranks uh, within the Democratic Party, and that's by helping to elect more Latinas. Let me let me ask you just briefly: how 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 often do you reach across the aisle to work with Republican Latinos? Uh, Republican Latinos, hmm, uh, tough, you know. I mean, uh, uh, there well, are Republican Lat <laughs> there are Republican Latinos. Yeah. There are Republican Latinos who. Oh. Um, have a more moderate position on immigration. I mean, is it is it not a is it not a place of common ground? Um, you know, I there's something to be said about uh, that we are harsher on the people that we're closest to, or that we you know um, like we're harsher on our families right. uh, than anything else. And I find that there is a huge space for me to be able to work across the aisle with my Republican colleagues. Unfortunately, um, other than uh, Ross Layton. 
you know, she's been... Liliana, she's who's, been, who's uh, obviously, this is her last... Uh, she's I'm sad that down. she's leaving because uh, she has been uh, My one person <laughs> who I've been able to work with. But I've been able to work with other uh, members. We have a caucus, a Central America caucus, that has, that has been working on um, addressing the root causes of migration. Um, you know, I founded that with, representative, with a representative from uh, California, David Valadale. When I first got to Congress, you know, this is, uh, um, we're doing really good work uh, focusing on helping the youth there in these three countries of the Northern Triangle. Um, we know that it's a lot easier, cheaper, and we, look, I get it. We can't help every person that comes to our southern border, but we should be working um, together to help them in their own country so that they can see a future for themselves there. I, I blame the government of Guatemala because I should have had an opportunity uh, to, to be a member of Congress in Guatemala. Heck, I should have been the president of Guatemala, <laughs> right? But, but that, wasn't, um, that wasn't a future for me. They stole that from me. And we have to hold them accountable, too. Uh, we have to hold them accountable for the number of children that are fleeing because it's, they're, so, they're, they're violent countries and because they are stealing the money that is supposed to be going to, to fund education, to fund health care, and to fund all the programs that the youth needs. All right, um, it's time for questions. Yes? Um, yeah? Hi, my name is Veronica Morales, and um, as we talk about voters, um, I was actually up in New York last weekend and did a phone bank for Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and I talked to a voter who said, well, <clears throat> they just put them up there, and they don't do anything for our community, so why should I go vote? And there's a lot of Latino voters that think that way. Um, how, would we, how do we encourage our community to think differently people that do think in that manner. When you say we just put them up there, you mean like they just... They're politicians. Just, we politicians, just put them so up it's there. like Latinos don't do anything for their own people, is that...? Latinos, politicians, they just get the title and then they don't really do anything. They're just politicians. Okay. I, I think it's a fair question. It's, a, it's, it's something I hear all the time, you know, from, from uh, constituents when I talk to them uh, about getting out and, and voting. Um, it, it's a fair question in a way that people don't understand the process and what it takes um, to get a bill across, right? Um, especially when you're in the minority. Uh, what I hear a lot is, when you're in the state, you pass all this legislation, well, what's wrong? What happened to you when you got to Congress? <laughs> well, you know, we were two thirds in California, you know? Uh, we were the super majority. We were able to do a lot. Uh, here in Congress, it's taken me a lot longer because I do have to work across the aisle uh, with many of my colleagues. I do write legislation that sometimes I have to ask a Republican member to put their name on this legislation so I can get something done for my community. It's a humility, uh, being humble enough to understand that you got to do what it takes to do to deliver for the people that you care about. All right. Um, uh, yes? And then you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, as a young Latina woman who would like to get involved in politics, and I'm sure there's a lot of women here who would like to as well, what is an obstacle we are going to have to face, and what is your advice to us to overcome that? The obstacles are no different today than they were when I first ran uh, for public office in 2000. Um, I had no endorsements. Uh, nobody would give me money. I had to save, you know, a, a bit of, uh, of money of my own. I uh, walked, you know, my entire um, community. There were only 32,000 um, people in, my, in the district that I was running. Um, but we, that's not an obstacle, right? I broke my ankle five weeks before election day. Mm -hmm. You know what I did? I didn't sit home and cry about it. I rented a wheelchair, and I got volunteers to help push me you know, to continue to go door to door. You know how many how many votes I won that election? No, nope, nobody wants to run against you. This is chasing prom queens in wheelchairs. <laughs> I won by seventy five votes. Seventy five votes. So you know, the bottom line is, do you have the guts? Do you have the grit? You know, when people people are going to tell you no. I was a state senator. I just won. Uh, a, a special election in a state senate when I first ran for Congress in 2014. 
You know how difficult it was to get, I didn't get the Democratic endorsement here. You know who was with me? Emily Sliss from day one, right? And you know what? I was going to be the one to win. All the polls said that. I was the only elected official on that ballot. But they would rather have maybe somebody else. I don't care what they want. I fought for this. This is where I wanted to be. And this is where I am. All right, we have time for one more question. And it's, I promise, that young lady in the back there. Yeah. Um, good morning. My name is Pamela Toscano. I just wanted to say that your story attests to the fact that um, there are disparities that exist within the Latino community, the black community, all different communities. So how do you respond to people when they say that the needs of the Latino community fit the exact needs of other people when your story attests that that's not always the case? Right. In our community, I mean, they, they vary a little bit uh, because we have, uh, we're immigrants. Um, so some of us are, you know, first generation, second generation. We still have families you know, in the countries that we immigrated from. So there's that need. But everything else, when it comes to jobs, when it comes to health care, when it comes to safe schools and safe communities, we're the same as everyone else. Um, you know, I always, as a locally elected official, you know, I always said, I don't wear the brown on my shoulder. I work to serve my community, all of my community. And when I'm helping, I'm focusing on jobs, you know, I'm not focusing on jobs only for Latinos. I'm focusing on jobs for all of my community. Um, so we shouldn't just run on the Latino ticket. You know, don't pigeonhole yourselves um, to that because you're going to find out that you're going to be short on votes. You have to be able to work, you know, with a constituency that is diverse and that is broad and that you may not agree with. The one thing that my voters said about me in this last poll that I'm very proud of is we don't agree with everything that she does, but we know that when she says she's going to do something, she does it and she sticks to her principles. That's like the best compliment that you can give anyone in elected office, and that's what I work for. All right. Thank you so very much.